Uh, thank you, Kofi, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is um, this is number seven. Five. Ah, okay, number five. All of them just I thought it was more than that, but uh, in the series of Tector Lake series. And uh, my name is Steve Largent. Uh, um, I was uh, been at the Conservation District here for about 31 years, and uh, I'm 32. I uh, started out in construction and um, here in Trevor City. And, um, and my heart really wasn't into it, so I went back to school and got my degree in wildlife biology, but then aquatic emphasis. I was lucky enough to bring it back home here and put it to work. Uh, grew up on Spider Lake, and um, so it, you know, I've, I've just been blessed to um, live here in Northern Michigan on an inland lake and then be able to help um, protect and preserve what we have here. And um, I want to ask Ellie, do you think if I mute this one? That would help. Already fix it. Oh, you already fixed it. Oh, okay. yeah. that's how great she is. She's got <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'd like to, um, as Kofi said, you know, really uh, thank um, Ralph and Carol and Patty, um, and then also Judy Nevins is here as well, and Greg. Um, but Ralph, Carol, and Patty have been working as friends of the Spider Lake and also friends of Rennie Lake. Uh, on this um, Protect Our Lake series. Um, and it's been great because we've been able to put it on our website. A lot of people have viewed it there. Uh, and I know uh, Judy and Greg have also been working on um, the East Bay Township um, Overlay District for uh, zoning. And um, that's been awesome and wonderful. There's other people here that I've missed that's been working on that as well. Thank you as well. But uh, it's an effort to try to um, you know, protect what we have. Um, because we're going to develop, but it's how we develop and how we grow that's uh, that's key. So, um, so this, uh, like I said, this presentation is a collaborative effort between uh, the Conservation District, friends of the Spider Lake and Running Lakes, and taking place here at the Nature Center. The Nature Center was built uh, in 2008. Thank you very much. Uh, the Conservation District was established in, in 1941, this Conservation District was. So we've been around a while, uh, but we uh, figured uh, education is the key to uh, restoration and protection, because when you understand something, you will be more uh, likely to protect and take care of it. Uh, so this, uh, this Nature Center, that's what we've been able to do um, since 2008, but through over 110,000 uh, visitors through this center since then. So uh, a lot of those children. Um, the meeting is being recorded and um, Zoom uh, participants will not be uh, seen or heard. But if you would please, if you're on Zoom, just type into the chat box where you're from. And uh, so we can kind of you know, gauge where, where folks are listening in from. Uh, also during the uh, presentation, if you have questions, uh, please type that into the chat box as well uh, during uh, Ellie's presentation. So um, I think that uh, that's about it. I'm not sure if you'll take questions during your presentation or you want to make wait to the end. Wait to the end. And um, so with that, uh, before we get going, uh, any questions? Anybody? Restrooms? Restroom behind the mirror. Yep. <laughs> yeah, right behind what the store or that door. And yes, sir. Are you guys connected with people? No, we are not. We're, conservation districts are non-regulatory. Well, most conservation districts are non-regulatory. Some conservation districts oversee their local soil erosion program, but uh, we are not connected with uh, people at all. So if you want to do something with your shoreline, yes. we don't have to get a permit from you. Yes, uh, you do. Yeah, I'll yes. get to that. Yes, well, you are connected. <laughs> No, we are not connected to Eagle, but you do need permits to, you know, if you're below the ordinary high water mark, you need a permit from the you know, Department of uh, Energy, Great Lakes and the Environment. And if you're above the ordinary high water mark, uh, you do not, but then you do need, in both cases, need to get a solar erosion permit. Who decides that? That is set by Eagle. Yeah. Yeah, that is set by Eagle. And for most lakes, um, they have them for most lakes, so that's not something that we we wow. do. now we will come out and, and provide some um, assistance in looking at your lake shore and talking about you know what you can maybe want to do. But. Yeah, I'm 
I'm an invader. I'm from Lake Lee. Okay. <laughs> and um, the South Lake doesn't have a permanent high or low water lake because a judge in 1978 ordered that the lake level of South Lake Hidenau be raised to 589.2 feet okay. on April, lower to 588.2 feet in May. Mm -hmm. If you have a uh, hot plain forest and heavy top soil lakeshore as opposed to a steep grade moraine, you've got a problem with that. So yeah, I mean, that's something that we're, we don't get into with the conservation district. You will have to um, contact Eagle. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, that's not something that we oh. are going to be covering today. Anything else you want to add to that, Rob? No. Okay. That's yeah. Fine. Sure. I'm just curious. Would you do a quick poll um, to see where most of our audience from? Lakes, forests, streams. <laughs> okay, Lake Luno. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll start in the back corner there, Wayne. General Lake. Yep. Yeah, Lake and yeah. Lake. Oh, I see. Yeah. General Lake. Okay. Lake. Stream. Lake. Stream. Any lake. Stream. Fine. Forest. River. Oh, you're in Portland. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. And so, yes, a lot of lake and, uh, but, uh, you know, our, uh, all of our lakes, rivers, and streams are fed by groundwater. So we also have to be cognizant of what we do to the ground and the soil. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ralph. Ralph is retired from the Michigan Park for Environmental Quality, uh, which is now Eagle. Um, after a 35-year career in environmental protection and water resources management, he's a limitologist. Um, three months after retiring, Ralph came back to uh, DEQ Water Resources Division as a US EPA senior. Um, employment program specialist to coordinate the implementation of the uh, National Lakes Assessment, NLA, in Michigan. And he's also served uh, as a trainer for, um, for NLA. And like I said, Ralph lives on uh, Rennie Lake and is on the uh, Spectre Lake, uh, or the East Bay Township Overlay uh, Committee. Anything I missed? I mean, uh, I know there's a whole lot more, like five pages. <laughs> Yeah, so Ralph. Thanks, Kofi, for your welcome. Nice. So, again, I'm Ralph Bednarz, and I'm a retired geologist, a lake scientist. I work uh, with the Department of Environmental Quality, originally DNR, because there was only one agency back then when we started. Got split into the DEQ and, and DNR, and then, um, and then, um, now, DEQ is renamed EGLE, the Environment, Rennie Lakes, and Energy. Um, I now reside on Rennie Lake, a bucket list item of mine once I retired working on our lakes in Michigan with the Limo. I mean, was able to put that together, and we do reside on Rennie Lake in East Coast Township. So, the Protecting Our Lakes and Shorelands and Fall series began in the spring of 2019. Poles was developed by a group on Spider Lake, the Friends of Spider Lake, as a forum to discuss water quality and ecosystem protections with local water and land resource professionals. Led by Carol Puso, um, its goal is to spread information and knowledge to better to be better water stewards. Held at the Grand Lake Outdoor Recreation and Education Center, GORAC, uh, during May and June of 2019, the inaugural full speaker series brought in Heather Smith, our Grand uh, Travers Baykeeper of the Watershed Center, uh, Katie Grisiak, the former Northwest Michigan uh, Invasive Species uh, Network Coordinator, and Camera Ross, a former uh, District Forest. My wife and I had just moved into the house on Rainy Lake, uh, two parcels down from Gorek during March of 2019. I learned about the, the first poles series. So I got in my canoe and I canoed over to GORAC's waterfront and climbed up the bank there into the, into the facility and, and, the, and the, the event was going on. So I attended the first event and the rest is kind of history. So after the first year, I became directly involved with the planning of the following full series. Okay, we have a separate, next slide please. Oops, I'll get Okay, that's great. 
So when polls had to go to uh, virtual presentations in 2020 due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we partnered with the Grand Rivers Conservation District. And I reached out to several of my professional uh, colleagues uh, to bring in some lake science uh, topics to polls. So the 2020, the 2021, and the 2022 poll series topics are listed here. And you can read the uh, specific topics. Um, and we covered quite a bit of aspects of lakes during those years. And these are all virtual events. Uh, they were recorded and they're all available on the uh, Grand Paris County website. So today we've come full circle and take another look at the importance of trees to lake shorelines and shorelands. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Ellie Johnson, District now the district forester of Leelanau, Benzie, and Grand Traverse uh, Conservation Districts. And to mention on camera, um, and Molly's kind of following in her footsteps of camera. And here's Ellie. Thank you. 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 Thank and uh, wetlands in general, in that dynamic zone between open water and forested uplands, right? With that, with the transparency of I am the forest too, right? So I don't necessarily have like a wetland you call a degree or things. I've done a lot of field work in wetlands. I've done multiple field courses in wetlands between grad school and undergrad. But um, so with all that transparency of talking about the plants in particular, but there are, I'm gonna talk at the end of all these other government agencies, all these other humans that are much more knowledgeable than some of these things we're gonna to touch on today, right? So yeah, I've also said I grew up on a small farm in here in Pennsylvania and I like playing outside. So I went to undergrad in Pennsylvania where I got a BS in environmental bio and a BSc in secondary bioeducation. So I do have a teacher certificate, but I like doing it more like this instead of being in a high school. So more power to those people. Than I have. Um, and then I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to like do science, whatever that meant, and then to teach people about science. So I took a few years figuring that out and lived in like seven different states doing different like plant surveys and environmental education jobs, among other things, a pizza shop, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> uh, but then I really missed trees. I kept living in the West and I um, went to grad school at Clemson University, which is upstate South Carolina. So I got an MS in forest resources. I graduated in 21. I don't recommend doing grad school during a pandemic. That's a little wild time for all of us. Um, and then I moved up to Michigan where I worked for Cake Sismo, which is based in Antrim Conservation District in Bel Air, where I was doing habitat resilience surveys. So I was handed this iPad with all these ecosystems of importance, surveying if there was a basic plant presence there. Hence, I was bushwhacking through a lot of wetlands when I first moved to Michigan, and I thought it was great. Camera retired. Here we are. So what we're covering today, we're gonna to get some general like lake ecology stuff, right? We're gonna talk about wetlands and why they're cool and different than all the other things next to them. We're gonna talk a bit about how the most, in the most general sense, because everyone's face is different, right? Of how we have shifted that ecology, right? And then um, sort of talking about some next steps, like, okay, based on those shifts that we have caused, um, what, what are some other alternatives Alternatives that we can do, what are different resources you have to work with, other folks that meet, and all that kind of stuff. If you were at the Spider Lake Association meeting last July, a lot of things similar. I'm sorry, don't give jokes away before they happen. Just try this out with that the rest of us. There are some new, there's some new but if you were last year, hello again. Welcome back. So, um, wetlands are dynamic spaces, right? So, they're the interface between open water and then upland forest systems, right? And so a lot of different things can be changing about those as far as like water level rise and fall. Obviously all this stuff's gonna be exacerbated by climate change and shifting seasonality, right? When we get precipitation and how much. But even like before any of that, in general, wetlands for our entire plant's existence have been areas of a lot of shifting, a lot of different types of disturbance, and it's based on those water fluctuating levels, right? Um, so with that, they're not stagnant spaces, both on like the abiotic, the non-living components of that space, or the biotic things, because all the living stuff's gonna respond to those changes, right? And so it's something like you're driving down wetlands and stuff, you might be seeing some standing dead trees, that might be due to some water fluxes that's very normal stuff, right? 
whenever something else is dying, you're making space for something else. So they generally look like this, all these different types of plants and um, different ecosystem patches within a space, right? Um, so, because I get a lot of calls about some going out, I do a lot of site visits with Joe. We do a lot of presentations like this. I also get asked to be at people's properties. And a lot of the wetlands I walk through, someone's got a lot of concerns. It's really just the wetland doing some wetland thing. Water, water temperature, water level flux, and drowns out some roots, which might kill this tree, which might let some other smaller stuff start moving in. So it's a very dynamic mosaic space, right? Um, and with that, because it's that combo, so a lot of this presentation, no offense to animals, animals are cool. I'm talking about plants. Plants are even cooler. They sit there and wait so you come and look at them, right? I don't think that. But wetlands are really neat because it is this uh, middle zone between two different types of ecosystems. So like this is a stat I got from this Lake College course I took through MSU Extension. But apparently 155 different animals live within the transition zone in Michigan, right? And it's they might not need it for all their steps of their life cycle, but that many different organisms are using that strip at some point in their existence. Uh, which is makes it uh, a lot of threatened endangered species, a lot of these different smaller plant stuff, uh, they are existing in that space and then all these different organisms are utilizing that as well. Um, with that same idea as far as talking about dead trees, for example, with that intermediate zone, um, I don't know if any of you like to fish, you should be casting where the dead trees have fallen into your water, right? That's where they're going to be laying their eggs, that's where they like to hide, that's where they get a rest from the currents, that's where all of your fish are hanging out. And actually, so this top picture here, there's a lot of initiatives. Um, Christmas is kind of a waste of time as far as like how much stuff we can do and leave behind, right? And every year we throw out millions of Christmas trees. There's a lot of different initiatives across different states. There's some here even, they collect them behind the library um, over at Morgan Lake, but they'll use all that forest woody debris for river restoration projects to add that like feathering effect on the sides of rivers and give habitat for all these fish to hang out in the more you know. Um, yeah, so with this, talking about all that dynamic and stuff, so plants can't move, so they've got, a, they're sitting there with a lot of genetic material to hopefully withstand a lot of different types of conditions, whether having their roots real wet, dealing with different levels of drought, they, they're eventually going to pass away, right? They can withstand a lot of different stuff. Trees are really resilient, awesome beings, um, but they can't run away from the problems. They can't like lift up their feet and get out of the soil. And so with that, there's, they can handle a, a range of environmental stressor, stressors and they can handle a lot of those happening at the same time. Even. So like all these different things, right? So those water levels, the nutrients go in that soil, the amount of shade that they're getting from competing trees, and uh, energy diffusion, as far as like how much they can actually handle getting pushed around in a certain space, right? In general, and this is just also tuck in the back of your head, if a tree in your yard is having a rough time, like if you see increased insect or bird activity on that tree, it is probably because something else is up first and that tree's immune system is weakened because it's not able to photosynthesize as well to withstand any type of attack or something else, right? I get calls a lot about the bug part or like increased woodpecker activity, but a tree might be having a bad time with something around it, not necessarily something on it. That's just a symptom of a bigger problem, right? Um, so with and thinking of that energy diffusion stuff, we're gonna talk about that for a bit because energy diffusion as a, um, what's the word for? This is something that's going to impact wetlands along open water, right? So those spaces, because they're going to get buffeted by different types of energy compared to something existing in a forest, right? And so thinking of that, trees, plants, they're not growing anything extra. All of their stuff is needed by that being, right? That's why they're growing. And part of that is um, coming from, let's just say, oh, no. We'll go back to this picture here. Um, Part of that is as far as thinking with, oh, I want to this, sorry, I have the cake photo. So, um, with this diffusion energy idea, um, all the different branches, the way the stem works in a tree and stuff, it's able to handle a certain amount of buffering from the winds that are hitting it, right? And so, think of it like a feathering effect um, or like a owl's fly, they're really, they're silent, right? The way their feathers are so 
taper down into thin little strips, they're able to move through the air without any noise. Yeah. Tree branches are trying to do the same kind of stuff. They're growing out in a way that they can handle being moved around in spaces, um, which is of a lot of different skills that they're having to be able to live in those different wetlands. But this one is a huge one, right? Because they're going to be on that open water that may be dealing with a lot of energy. So I changed the order of some of these, and clearly my brain did not like the order changing to. <laughs> but we're going back. What the trees are doing as far as when they're immediately by shoreline spaces, they're influencing the water and the soils that are immediately around them, right? And they're influencing that in these different ways. So when they're over top of soils, think of hemlocks. Hemlocks make the most truest shade. They're the most shade tolerant species in Michigan. And when you're hiking through the woods and you notice groves of hemlocks, they are definitely the darkest part in the woods as you're going, right? All of that, like trapping up all that sunlight in their canopy, that's going to change the soils immediately around them, right? The amount of water in that soil, it's going to be a little bit higher because it's not hitting, getting as much sunlight warming it up, right? So the influence of soil moisture, when they're over top of waterways, uh, they'll be influencing the water temperature, which will in turn influence how much dissolved oxygen is in there, which will influence how much decomposition, like the speed of the rate of composition, decomposition happening in the space which in turn will influence all the different macro and vertebrates and little things living and eating in that spot. Um, and even just like thinking of simple physics, tree roots are offering a lot of different physical barriers for keeping things intact, right? So they're reducing erosion and they're reducing sediment into that river system. A interesting example of this, sad example of these different ideas, um, is we've lost a lot of black ash trees in the last 20 years. Uh, black ash was a, a wetland riverine ecosystem tree. And back in 2002, somebody found an emerald ash borer outside of Detroit. And in the last 20 years, they have killed millions of ash trees in our state. There's green, white, blue ash also, but black ash in particular is killed 98% of the black ash. And the majority of them were found along river systems. So think about that, right? If you lose all that canopy, all those living roots holding something together, so all those rivers that they were along, they're going to have increased water temperature, which will decrease the oxygen in space, right? Which will totally shift all the different little bugs and how much decomposition is able to happen there. When you don't have all these roots holding all those shorelines, you're going to have increased sediment, which will also mess around with the amount of oxygen and stuff, right? And the turbidity of the space. Um, with all of that, though, our rivers lead to somewhere. So a lot of the fish that we like to go fishing for, all our game fish species, are cold water fish species, right? So then there's all this ongoing research between MSU and the University of Michigan as far as like in losing almost all of our black ash trees, which was a major component of a lot of wetlands, how might that be influencing all these other pieces of the ecosystem downriver? Which is pretty well. So I'm curious if all of this. Um, not my favorite story, right? But this is like a really good example of like how important they can be in different spots because you can influence all that stuff down the line. Um, yeah, so this is just to, to keep the illustration from us to attention. This just illustrates that uh, you're going to hit a point of soil saturation where woody plants can't really hang out in space. We're going to start tapering down in stem height and things. To and like just with like roots and stuff, the closer you get to open water, your vegetated vegetation is just naturally going to change, right? There's not a lot of woody things that are just going to go on right out of the water. It, they did probably didn't start there if that's the case. They're dealing with the flood. Um, but you've seen all this. A lot of you are living on lakes, right? You've known this feathering effect between um, more grassy patches. You know that's going to be a lot more wet than where your trees are near your space, right? Sorry, we touched on this. Uh, let's see, do you need anything else? This feather idea that I was talking about strictly for diffusing en energy in an individual tree, the branches being able to handle wind and stuff, that's also what wetlands overall are doing around a space, right? So that idea of transitioning from those herbaceous grasses to wildflowers, like those different wetland species to woody plants and stuff, you have, and again, being a dynamic ecosystem that we're talking about, you have this ability as far as the ecosystem as a whole to withstand some different things and those changes. So that, that is very important when we're starting to think about this idea again, but also going into that 
energy. When you're along the lake shore, you get hit by a lot of different energy it's coming from the wind, but it's also coming from waves. It's my life. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I have to be some might recognize uh down here. <laughs> Oh, I'm on the left hand side. Yeah. Okay, Ed's right here. <laughs> but um, so <laughs> um, so what causes you, right? Um, well, it's all coming down to wind again, and wind energy is influenced by a lot of different things with the atmosphere, but a lot of its temperature fluxes between spaces. Um, so one of the words that you should know is fetch. So that's the maximum unobstructed distance across the lake from your shoreline. So Depending on how far you are from the opposing shore, that's a lot of space for waves to pick up energy as it's getting to you, right? So that's going to influence your category of wave action. This list down here. So when you're looking at the strip of shoreline that you have on a lake body, it'll probably have this uh, in Eagle MSU extension. They all talk about these different phrasing, but it's a Nice thing to know as far as how much wave action, like what category of wave action your space may be, because there's different managements that you should be thinking about depending on the level of energy you're receiving. Um, yeah, so considering that, that the wind coming through, also the water depth, the um, shallow, more shallow spaces, you're going to have more energy moving through a spot. And so all of this stuff's going to be impacting all those plants that are holding your shoreline together, right? And so now we're going to talk about how we have maybe monkeyed around with some of those spaces a little too much or, and have changed some of those characteristics I just talked about. Um, so wetlands are dynamic, right? Things will die. Now we parcel things out into like five acre chunks, two acre chunks, half acre chunks. And so we're just all owning a piece of a larger pie, larger landscape, and nothing else that is alive on this planet cares about our arbitrary property lines, right? So things are happening beside us and through our spaces because that's just, we've been trying to compartmentalize spaces that aren't really able to be. Um, so even with that, as far as like, that comes down to like writing laws, that comes down to stuff that you're trying to own, um, where's technically the waterway and where's technically the land, right? As we just talked about, for eons, that's been shifting anyway for all these different spaces, right? But we're trying to put a lot of rules, a lot of pieces of paper on things that aren't very easy to find um, throughout their entire existence. So, with that, we are inadvertently causing a lot of different issues that we may not even see on the immediate space that we're impacting, right? Saying that with black ash, if you lose a lot of stuff along the river, you're still going to impact what's happening in the lake that it was into, right? So, uh, wetlands. And shoreline management, shoreland management is an interesting kind of situation because whatever you're doing might have a greater impact on someone across the lake from you, down the river from you, that you just might not actually see. So with this, and again, going back to the same energy confusion idea, something that we've done a lot is change the amount of energy that's in some of these different ecosystems, right? Just by asking folks wanting to have a good time. I was on a boat yesterday. Like, it's okay. Boats are cool. I'm not here to like trash boats. Um, they are changing the amount of waves and where those waves go and how much wave energy is moving into a space, right? So there's different things that we are doing that are um, exacerbating some of that general ecology stuff that we were talking about, but also straight up removing some of that ecology to handle some of those changes. So we're going to go on a little picture heavy adventure. It might get overwhelming to me. But so when I first moved to Michigan, I lived outside of Mesa Lawn. There was a big twin lake that I cut out of this. We're going to talk about little twin. Okay. I know there's other twin lakes. That's probably like one of the most common lake names in Michigan. But I chose this one. And so again, with this, uh, thinking of this idea that these are dynamic spaces, right? So before humans have even shown up in any of these spaces, this has been flexing a little bit. I know they were carved out by glaciation, right? But there's still the drawing of this map that I stole from some Google search. This is not necessarily that crisp of a space, right? There's a lot of feathering of land and water mixed with stuff. That's due to water fluxes in a space. The temperature has been fluxing in the space. So even though this is a stagnant picture, of like here's where this lake is now, just remember in the back of my mind, this is not going to very crisp line for the entire system, right? 
it's looking like this. So um, in general, so you got an open body of water, and then there's that feathering of those different vegetation communities, right? So now you go past the past some cattails that eventually run the hemlock groves, red maple trees, or up in the paper birch trees, or up in more of seeing more aspen groves and stuff, right? So you have the building up. Uh, where is it? Oh, this is from. Uh, swamp melty. I don't know if you're all melty fans, but if you have a wet space, you should plant this. Yeah. Right. But so this is generally what it looks like, like, right? So none of those lines are very crisp. You've got a lot of different types of layers of vegetation that are eventually working their way to forested land, right? And uh, so someone actually found the spot and put a house there because of the house trees. And then they told their friends, and so they all brought their own houses and their books. And uh, this, obviously, all these different developments. I mean, initially, with like even thinking of indigenous presence or initial European colonization, some of the impact might not have initially been that intense. We've gotten a bit more intense with our development practices and stuff, right? And so, with the increased energy in a space, it's got to go somewhere. And especially thinking of boats and things, like you don't just simply have a fetch of just like that wind moving across the lake anymore, you've got this extra energy, little ripples and stuff's happening from stuff that we're doing in different spaces, right? So that person that had been there originally, they might have a shoreline that's starting to look kind of rough. So they dump a lot of rocks around that. They're like, ooh, my shoreline's trying to get away from me. Let's uh, hold it down some of these rocks. So now you've got a hard surface that does not absorb any of that energy anymore. And it becomes more of an extra pinball adventure, right? So then those neighbors are starting to be like, ooh, our shoreline is starting to look kind of rough. But it's not being absorbed into this person's space. It's also starting to run into my space. And so when we take these dynamic feathered ecosystems with multi layers of being able to handle and fuse energy before you hit that upland forested ecosystem, all that energy is starting to get trapped and just moving around that lake and you're impacting all the different spots that are left around it, right? And so that can start looking like erosion in a totally different part, or you can start undercutting the banks in another part of the lake, right? I think I'm a third picture. Oh, and then you, you might be harming and killing the trees of someone else. Not necessarily your own. So all of this, in thinking of that, just like with that energy idea in particular, when we've been actively removing all the different plant communities that have been responsible for diffusing that as it goes into more forest dense spaces, um, you in turn get this kind of response from the environment, right? As we mowed things down and removed different plants and stuff and brought in impenetrable, rocky hard surfaces, that energy needs to go somewhere. It's gonna get absorbed by something. And now it's getting absorbed more in a destructive manner than what's by what's currently there, right? With all of that, um, that was the most general synopsis <laughs> that I could have given all of you, right? This is not a one size fits all. Not everyone's decisions are awful, not everything we've done are awful or anything like that. But that was just like a little snapshot of the, okay, so this is in recent human history. This is how we've been using our uh, lake systems and how we may have been making it a bit more difficult for them to handle the general ecology that's happening in this model, right? So then how should we be thinking about, because again, sorry, no offense to rocks. Rocks are still very much needed in different instances. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but there are alternatives to what you could be doing if you are a super lucky human that's got some shoreline property, right? Um, that will keep some of those different things in mind as far as having re reintroducing that feathering effect of having like a multi layered ecosystem to go from that open water that you like boating and swimming in and stuff up to where the terrestrial plant communities are. There's, we need to bring some sort of that kind of space back. There is a transition zone there. And this is done in a whole bunch of different ways. A lot of these following slides, I think Steve Larkin, when I gave this last year, you gave me some of the pictures in this, or um, some of it's from MSU Extension. So it's some of this stuff, you need a landscape architect, you need eagle, you need all sorts of things. But I'm going to show you examples of different alternatives for how you can be managing your shoreline. Because again, there is not a one size fits all. Depending on the energy of your shoreline, like if you're a lower energy space, meaning that you don't really get hit with a lot of 
water and wind action in the little strip that you happen to have. You can very much do a hands-off approach to this let whatever's growing in there grow in there more, right? However, if you are in an area with that increased fetch, if you've got that high wave action and stuff, um, rocks are helpful for those. If you happen to be in that high card spot, I'm so sorry, Ed, I'm going to save it for the end if that's okay. Sorry. I'm going to save you for the end if that's okay. Oh, I just wondered if you needed a permit for that rock. Yes, yes you very much do. That's why yeah. we'll get to you. We'll get to that. Um, so we're going to just, again, this is not necessarily my wheelhouse. I'm showing examples of like, things I've learned about and like folks around me that they're helping um, folks put in. So if you're in a low energy space with that idea again, that like you're not really getting hit by that much in your water action, you can simply just stop mowing along your shoreline, right? Just to bring that feathering impact back into your space. All of these root systems and stuff will help hold your shoreline in, but also all those other really awesome benefits like habitat and stuff. Remember, there was a whole bunch of animals that exist in that transition zone, right? So now you sort of brought that all back for them, right? This, and again, with all these, every time I show you something, like, yeah, this is super ideal. Lazy landscaping is generally the best native landscape you can do, right? Leave your woody debris and stuff. This is not always a in everyone's space. Um, sometimes it gets a bit more involved, right? So uh, bringing in some different native plants. We have a native plant sale that happened three weeks ago, four weeks ago. We did not have this last week. Um, there's all these different opportunities and all these different great nurseries that emphasize native plants in our area, but it may be something that brings some of that diversity back into your space, bringing in more woody plants back into the area, right? Uh, but then, it, depending on where you are, depending on the degradation of your shoreline, and again, how much energy you're getting into the space, you might need to be more involved with your management, right? And there's a, this is an example of these coconut fiber. Uh, sometimes they just leave it as a full on mat going up the shoreline. Sometimes it's rolled up like this and staked down. But that kind of stuff, it's a natural material that will break down over time. And so it gives you a bit of a buffer of like, let's hold this in here immediately. Let's get some native plantings going behind this. So this is like our little transition zone, looking rough. This. As it breaks down, it'll give nutrients for the plants you just put in there. And so this will help tide you over to what you're to hopefully one of those first kind of the floor lines, right? I think I have more. Yeah. So I have a couple more diagrams and stuff like this. Uh, even and like sometimes these coconut mats are designed with like different woody debris and stuff within them. And so you can even like plants stuff right into that space. And then as that breaks down, it's like that uh, poo culture, that German style of gardening of burying your woody debris and then planting in that. So you're sort of capitalizing on the decomposition that'd be happening in a space anyway. Um, let's see, I've got another. Yeah. Uh, and even sometimes with stuff like this, and depending on that energy that your shoreline's receiving, um, different smaller rocks, right? Rocks can be helpful to be holding that down. You put that coconut. Uh, rolled up or even like a mat up your shoreline and then planting up that, right? So it's there's all these different, depending on your space, there's different strategies for um, holding that space in, restoring that space, right? Bringing in those plants. Because sometimes folks jump right to the plant planting stuff and just going by the physics of their area, they might need a bit more like getting it that transition though, like holding it down with something to then plant in that spot, right? And then the plants sort of have a job from then on out. Uh, with that, so um, a lot of my segments, especially in the spring, when we're doing the seedling sales, I get a lot of questions of what people can plant where. And so if you've got wetter soils, if you're planting along the shoreline, these are different things. These are different trees that like having their feet wet. These are different shrubs that don't mind having their feet wet. Um, Branch heat shore, a lot of cottonwood. The majority of these that are up here between my three districts, a lot of them are sold here at this seedling sale in the spring. Um, seedling sales, how they work is you place an order between February and March, you pick them up at the end of April and then get them in the ground. If you don't get them in the ground, please heal them in or um, get them into a temporary nursery spot. Please don't leave them in the bundles that we put them in. Because <laughs> I do too many site visits where I'm like, like now it's June and I'm like that's okay. I should have been out here earlier, but um, we 
thinking about it, I have covered a few years space. These are some really good choices. With, okay, this next little chunk, all these following slides, these are other types of humans and other organizations that can help you with your project. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, like those coconut wraps and all these different things, changing up the physics of your shoreline, all that stuff needs to be purpose, right? Um, and, and so if you're like rerouting something, if you're building a bridge, if you're doing a boardwalk, uh, any, any of that kind of stuff, any more like the construction kind of stuff has to be approved by Eagle. And saying that of my three counties, my home office in Leelana, we are the ones responsible for soil erosion permits for construction projects in that county. The other two counties, it's, that's an office in the government center, I think maybe like North Fork and Lake right there, right? Right up A Street, that way. Um, but so in general, those soil erosion permits for doing contracting work, you're adding a deck, painting your driveway, all that different kind of stuff. There's also extra permits through that process. If you are, and it comes down to different things, if you're this many feet away from a wetland or different stuff. If you're actively working in a designated wetland space, you need these kind of things. Um, yeah, let's see, I have a here Permits required for drawing instruction, slow gradient soil types, wave action fed, final components. So if it, based on some of those different categories, um, Eagle, Wetland, so wetland delineation, right? You know that. So there's different things that qualifies an area as a wetland. So you have someone come out and survey, delineate out the actual edging of that wetland space. And based on the work you're doing within that space, there's different eagle permitting that's connected to that, right? Right. Oh, for example, that was just this guy that said. So the Christmas trees, right? The dumping woody debris, if you're just going to let a tree die and fall into your shoreline. There's eagle permitting for that kind of stuff too. You can't just straight up like dump stuff into the water, even if it's a good idea. So there is also a permit that comes with that kind of stuff too, to be aware of. Um, also, depending on where you live, um, which I should have, I didn't have the East Bay to that that I'm gonna do. Um, but there's different levels. Obviously there's lots of federal regulations that we're not gonna touch on. Thanks to the 70s, clean water, clean air, and all sorts of stuff after that, right? Um, but even there's different zoning ordinances by township and by county, even of what you can and can't do in these different spaces. For example, throwing up the Scoop Lakes watershed overlay. Um, that's an overlay between three townships that are around Crystal Lake. Anyone here? No? Uh, well, all right. Well, sorry, like <laughs> no representatives here. But um, that's a group that worked with my predecessor, Canva, to write up zoning ordinances specific for forest management practices within those townships that are in a certain proximity to Crystal Lake with the thought that the entire watershed encompasses the forest around it too, right? If you clear cut something on top of a hill that's a really sandy hill, that's maybe it's kind of far up from the actual waterway to get into, that soil's not gonna stay there anymore though, right? So it's kind of, it's trying to guide and regulate those kind of actions, even in the upland forest communities. Because again, Property boundaries are arbitrary. If you do something somewhere, you may impact something down the line. Right. Um, also, so I can't, this is from education it specifically. I don't have bias for anything, but I do know of two local private sector companies that are, that they have certifications in doing different weather work. So these are two outfits you can hire depending on the services that you're working on, like those coconut matting and different things. Um, Habitat is one. And the wildlife one that's looking to another as far as um, doing different restoration projects that would involve some of that like eagle permitting kind of stuff. So there's more it, or like helping you with planting some things, but some of that coconut matting stuff or dealing with changing the physics of your shoreline. These are two groups that can you can hire to do that kind of stuff. Great, you got it. <laughs> <Come on around. laughs> uh, but also in general, so yeah, eagle was. Uh, so do we, right? So you're in the Border of Nation Center in Grand Traverse. Um, I also work with Leelanau, right? And they're responsible for Leelanau County's soil erosion permits. But then also something to note, Benzie Conservation Districts, of my three districts, they do the most um, water quality kind of work as far as doing stream monitoring stuff, different lakes, even not necessarily in just Benzie County, they go over the borders a little bit, checking other neighboring lakes. Um, different beach plants. Also, they have 
the of the three of us, they have the aquatic invasive um, summer program as far as well as the boat washing stations, different education stuff. So just something to note of my three, even if you don't live in Mency County, if you've got some like water quality questions, there's some folks there. They do the most like water quality kind of projects. MSC extension obviously exists this past uh, winter. I did this virtual lake college course from January to the end of March. That was really cool. It was $90 for like 10 or 12 weeks of information. That was overwhelming. And I just tried to shove it in one hour. <laughs> it was you right now. Sorry, I spoke kind of fast. Uh, obviously, there's uh, different Michigan lakes and stream associations, but even there's also like local lake associations, right? Spider Lake Lake Association. Uh, Lake Lila Lake Association, they're doing some really cool work up there. Um, so you have all these other resources that people who are super jazzed to help answer your question when we talk about your places, right? And obviously, uh, one of those is me. So, um, again, I do more stuff with trees, but once I'm on your property and you already talked about your trees and you have to be like, you want to come look at my shoreline? Like, I can, I'm there, right? So, even though I'm not really your person for that, um, I may know the person who might. Also, one of the big things that happened for settlement in Michigan was uh, harvesting the forest. Yeah. So, what is your take on the impacts of that on our insurance? Yeah. So, um, quick American history lesson. Uh, European colonists came over, right? And we started on the East Coast and worked our way west. And then when we worked our way through Michigan, Michigan was pretty much clear cut by like the 1880s. So yeah, talk about like the black ash example, but times by like maybe like a year or so as far as extreme impact for some areas. So all of that stuff that I was saying as far as like losing canopy, all that would have happened, right? So all of those water levels would have risen even as far as like you didn't have all those trees pulling up a lot of stuff and the shorelines would have changed as far as like increased erosion and sediment buildup in different spaces, which would impact all the uh, submerged aquatic plants and like where different things are embedding and stuff underwater, which then like, yeah, all the way up, right? So um, all that same kind of stuff, again, with the black ash example. Um, and it's something where, so I've been alive for almost 30 years. That happened in the 1880s. And yeah. <laughs> Chicago, right? But so, there's, there's a lot of so that all happened. And then now I also was in a climate change webinar with this uh, researcher from some swanky school in New England. I don't remember which one. Uh, he had a name that sounded like a Harry Potter professor. That was like Shell Drake something. But um, he made the comment that no one under the age of 46 has experienced normal climatic conditions, which spooked the heck out of me, right? So I'm like, man, I didn't even really get a chance to see what how normal blood break and stuff happened. So um, with that intense impact of removing everything, and then also there's all stuff been grown back as we start shifting in this other way that we're not totally sure where we're going. Um, yeah, uh, it's one of those, like we're exacerbating a lot of stuff that was currently here, like maybe a lot of stuff is recovering, but we've definitely shifted in a way that whenever we use the word restoration, it's also cognizant of like, what does that actually mean? What are we storing stuff to? Like what, what other stagnant point of time are we trying to like make this look like? Because sometimes it's not always realistic to be like, oh, pre-colonization, this is the types of plants I want in my area that might not work anymore, right? So to answer your question, all those different impacts as far as changing water levels, water temperature, nutrients in those waterways from the rivers to the lakes that they're going to, which would change all the actual organisms that are able to hang out in those spaces, and you give that how many generations of impacts. We definitely shifted a lot of population dynamics and stuff with a lot of pieces that we wouldn't even know of yet, probably. And then we put them on this other adventure of like recover to what, right? Because now everything's continually shifting in different directions. Greg? With this help of the two of all the pests, not only aquatic invasive, but also forest and tree uh, imported pathogens that are affecting so many of our trees, it, it's kind of mind boggling where you can give your energy to try and preserve things as well as to develop things to be able to withstand not only the climate changes, but you know, 
the uh, adelgid that's coming, the you know, long horn beetle, the oak quilt, the beech bark disease, the beech leaf disease, the pine borer, the birch borer. So it's it's just uh, it's, it seems it's overwhelming. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. where I walk into someone's half acre lot and they own 10 red oaks and one of them has a case, right? Where it's like, okay, we have to start thinking about what else you're bringing in. So in general, my three counties, there's a lot of microtopography. So um, big old general statement as far as what the forest looks like, but it's a lot of and northern dry hardwood dominated forest. Um, and so with that, there's a lot of, there's not, Historically, like before, and thinking of that, like what are we comparing these two to before European colonization or different things? Um, we have a mix of a lot of different species that hang out here. And so, with a lot of folks I'm talking to them, it's like a diverse forest is a more resilient forest because if you do just happen to own a chunk of just like 98% sugar maple and they're walking through like timber valley, this has got to be crazy. And then I'm sitting there thinking about Asian longhorn of like, yeah, but it's got a, a time bomb a bit. So if you're bringing in different things, that's mainly what I'm talking to folks about. Um, glad you brought up Oakville, though. You all know Oakville, but I did throw a slide in here as far as like if you needed a synopsis of that. Does anyone need that? Have you? you know, all right. Experience that. Yeah. Right. So we don't need to see it. Um, just give me more of greats. It's not my favorite thing. You know the mic. Yeah, I don't know. It's different. <laughs> I have a question about putting green on our shoreline where I live on the board and the lake. Mm -hmm. And they, um, I have a question about blocks. Yes. Um, yeah. How do you decide whether or not, I know you said about the wave action and different things like that. How can you make that decision about whether the blocks would be effective or not effective? A lot of that's going to come down more to eagle um, surveying your space. And taking in all the physics of that space into account because like i was even saying like there's a continuum of solutions it's not just like um i wish folks wouldn't dump rocks so often i feel like they jump to that as as the only option sometimes but that there are there's a menu of stuff to consider before then is where my hesitation for rocks come from but there's definitely a space to use that type of stability because depending on the physics that your specific shoreline is dealing with that might be your main option and especially even that one camp wagon, um, which was sick people. <laughs> um, like even like this is an example, right? So it's like rocks and different pebbles of things um, can be and should be used for other like alternative solutions or stuff because uh, they can withstand high energy impact, right? But if you've got smaller rocks in a space, some of that energy can actually go through that area even. And it's just acting stability for all the other stuff you're planning in and around it. But you still might need like a cobblestone shoreline to deal with what is happening. What I get um, uh, upset about with rocks is whenever folks do have a lot of trees in their shoreline and then they're calling me like that all their stuff is dying. And then I'm out there like playing detective what environmental conditions are off about these trees because it might be a bunch of different species. But then they just put a bunch of like riprap on it like three years ago. And they're like, the canopy was totally like, what's happening here? I'm like, well, half of their body of half the, the same amount of biomass of that tree is also underground. And then we just put hundreds of pounds of rocks on them. So, so that's the kind of stuff where it's like considering what you're currently got and what's actually happening to a space to make an educated decision on the full suite of options. <laughs> With the thought that like rocks might be your best one. Do you have something to add to that? Because you would, like, I, 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 yeah, I was just going to say, you know, Ralph and I both go through the Metro Shoreline train, and it comes to low, medium, and high energy weight shores. You know, and if you have a long, like what uh, Ellie said about fetch, the, the length of the wall, open water, um, I mean, if you have a high fetch, you're going to. Uh, probably have a high energy shoreline that not only gets hit by wave action, but also ice action in the spring. And so you need to have rocks put in there, but in a way that isn't just tight up against the shore, but is out further to break up that wave action and also break up that ice you know, moving in. So it depends on the situation, like you know, Ellie said, but that's, that's what you take into consideration. 
And Steve, that's exactly what we had to do. I live up at the Elk Lake and we had the full fest coming across. We had it scared off. Yeah, or we put it's a gradual slope and it go out further. It yeah. breaks down the wave energy as it comes in. Right, you're trying to mimic that like feathering, right? right. So like with not having all those other like plant like layers of vegetation systems out to a space and all those roots and stuff that would be handling that. Having even like different size rocks, right? Changing that surface area, but it'll break down before it finally yeah, you, don't, you don't need necessarily be some of my neighbors have these monster boulders out there, but that but right. it's right there. Whereas I think the gradual is good. As you indicated, not only the wave action, but ice. Yeah. And the ice in the winter, I'll just move those big boulders. Right. Ralph, you have some time to Yeah. So just, just understand that anytime you can work below the water and high water line, it is required to have a permit. Mm -hmm. Eagle's permitting is very prescribed. It tells you exactly what you have to have and it gets inspected afterwards. And if you don't do it the right way, you have to change it. So with, with rip rock, with, with rocks, you need to have a certain slope. You can only go out so far into the lake. Um, and the slope is typically a one to four type slope. And the idea of that is to allow, um, allow animals like turtles to come up and use that shoreline. If you do anything more steep, then they can't get onto that shoreline. So it's, it has to have a permit and it's very prescribed. Uh, organizations that we can go to for information. One was in Habitat, and the other was Wildlife and Wetland Solutions, but not necessarily, that's not for information. Those are two businesses in the area that I know of that have different certifications that you can hire to do. Yeah. 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 So like the following slide, I feel like I have more like it um, this slide is for more people to like information in particular. Right. But so, I, I wanted the, the business. Yeah. 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 And Habitat will come out to your site and give you a half hour free consultation and discuss things with you at no obligation. So that's a, a good plus. He's, yeah, he's not a paid actor either. <laughs> but uh, Judy. Um, should, should we be proactive and do the granular treatment on our hemlocks um, now? Or should we wait? So uh, I wouldn't treat them unless it's part of a buffer zone of an active spot. So a lot of these different, there's a lot of research that goes into the chemicals that we use for different things, but it's not like an emerald ash borer situation. Um, I wouldn't start, like same thing with oak wilt. I wouldn't treat red oaks just because you own them. Um, it would just be if you were in proximity to an active site already happening. If anything, as far as like thinking of like hemlock um, proactive stuff, because it's, in the summer, it's in its little prong stage. So it's like little like, pepper flakes, yeah. right? So um, it's being moved around by us as we're traveling around camping and stuff. That's where they found it at Flat River Campground a couple years ago. And birds, it gets in with other birds and drop off in different things. We can't really control birds. We can't do something about the campers. But so if you're thinking of that, to survey your trees in the winter and to let me know immediately. Don't take a sample. Please don't take a sample because you might move it around because they're itty bitty. So let's take a picture. Okay, and that picture will even like drop a little GPS point. Like this is where I think I saw it. Because I'd love to tell you if you were wrong. Those are my favorite pictures to get. Like, oh, this is just a spider egg sack. Okay, fine. Um, but also to trim hemlock branches that are overhanging your driveway, right? So that is like your FedEx delivery driver and stuff can drive through there. Like anything that could be like straight from the top of cars that you don't know where they're coming from. That's just another very easy, proactive way to detect the hemlocks you've got in your space. And can we really grow some like a guy over there that has 130 <laughs> Oh yeah, it's almost in the news yesterday. That's not in Manistee. There's four sequoias. And then there's also, I mean, like Archangel H3 archives doing stuff with redwoods and sequoias down there. Um, yeah, we can plant them here. Um, I, but it's also something like we should think more about Michigan native plants okay. and not really rely on something from California to save us. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here. Okay. Oh, Quick yeah. question. Uh, yeah. You probably heard about the, the wave action lake boats that we have in Spider Lake in Virginia. Mm -hmm. boats that are making these huge bays and stuff. And now everybody's popping these big boulders everywhere, rip rap. Just um, to prevent that, but just a clarification when you say you put down that these big boulders and stuff, it's actually crushing the roots that come under that are coming under that and kind of towards the running lake shore or just clarifies it's just. Damage. 
it's a lot of weight, right? It's like a big old weighted blanket because it is. So it's just um, the same amount of biomass growing up is underneath, but it's not like a mirror image. Like they're not just like one giant half root node somewhere. A lot of the roots are within the top, how many, like four, six feet, eight feet of soil, right? So then we drop hundreds of pounds on that space. And then you compress that space. So all the air pockets between the soil and particles are gone. So there's no gas exchange into there anymore. They can't really pull water up from their root tips anymore. They can't maintain connections to the fungal, the mycorrhizal community that they were in. If you just like smush or like uh, micro uh, activity, right? So they just like smush all of that available soil moisture. Soil compaction is um, a nasty long-term thing. And so that's where it's like when I'm walking around the site, they're like, well, just start looking back this year. And but they might have put the big boulders in like three or four years prior. It can take a bit, but then there's no real recovery from that kind of space. And that's even like when I'm talking with folks about doing like a timber harvest and stuff, putting in the forest roads the most damaging part, right? Because that's where you're going to put all your big heavy equipment and you're going to be pulling a lot of weight out with all the logs on those trucks. So a lot of deliberate thought has to go into where to outline that. Because you, even if you don't do another harvest for decades, we'll all still be able to tell where that roadway was because there's going to be the most compaction uh, isolated, attempted to isolate it in that space, right? So it's to avoid like that soil compaction stuff. So it's not necessarily that they're like straight up breaking the structural roots stuff underground, but you're just like smushing all the good stuff out of it. So I'd like to put a question to Carol. Yeah. Answer is the elevation of spider like regulated because it, it, it seems to me that it is higher than it has ever been in my 42 years on the lake. Yeah, yeah no, uh, the only regulation is where it outlets down to our views and it's not formally regulated. Uh, there, it's uh, basically regulated by that culvert that outlets there. And um, well, so there's like a little dam up there that I think another bullet for people. Added to I think the water level in fire has been unnaturally high. But if you are there, any folks from our here? Okay, do you want more water? No, I don't. <laughs> yes, Eunice and they may be experiencing the same thing as well. It's just that we've been in some pretty high water years, and so, um, but that is regulated by that small name, by that. Uh, over um, by that individual, right? And then because there is no regulated lake. Bill, I saw your hand up. Yes, um, we have a large elm at Water's Edge. Yeah, is there now it appears to be healthy. Um, we've had people that have told us our birds that said, Oh, we can inoculate inoculate your tree to prevent anything and help it out. I hesitate to do it. I go fix what's not broke. Um, do we still have to worry about the Dutch elm disease and so forth and so on? Honestly, I don't know a lot about Dutch elms because I've only met maybe two elm trees in my life. Probably. <laughs> I mean, I've seen like some young ones coming up, but I don't I don't see them a lot because Dutch elm went through and killed off a lot of stuff. So with consulting someone about maybe treating this tree and stuff. If they're, if they're a person with a certified arborist through like the International Society of Arborists, if they've earned that certification, they have a similar education background that I do, but they've done a couple extra steps as far as like studying to take, there's a couple different exams to earn that. And then they do continuing education and credits to maintain that. So that would be someone, and depending on who it is, if they're like got a job site near you that they can stop to take a look at it, it may be a consult that you have to pay for, but it wouldn't hurt to just like ask and send a picture to somebody. And I can give you those lists of like folks in our area, but it'd be better if you were consult someone like that, just because I simply don't see elms uh, very often. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for not being sure about that. Yeah, that's an answer. Oh, cool, okay. Thank you, timing is, is right at, right at, thank you. Great. Um, so, um, I believe that Everyone, or at least the majority of everyone here, are um, tree lovers. Um, to sum up, um, not to sum up, it's your wonderful presentation. Would you give a summary of the role that trees play in, 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 in one of the ones that stood out in my um, 
recollection of the lakes course that um, you mentioned right. was um, how the canopy um, the canopy changes the heavy rainfall and then how that prevents runoff and and so on and so forth and you know what happens then to the water quality and the uptake of the roots of of um, um, pesticides or holding things hard with it had kind of a whole big summary of that. Uh, on the two minutes. Past <laughs> <laughs> me has answered this already, so we're just going to bring this up. Why do we care about trees? So that even has a little slide of how trees make the world better. Can right? you re screen share? Huh? Can you re screen share? Yeah, I can't. Thank you. Oh, that's online. Hold, please. Um, hold your thought. <laughs> Thank you. Right? Cool. Um, yeah, how do trees make the world better? <laughs> Not all of them, but that's how, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. You all know how to read. Um, but it's a lot of, they are the main framework for a lot of our biodiverse areas, right? And so all the responsibilities and stuff that comes with that. So all the nutrient regulation and forested areas influence the weather that immediately happens around them or even like immediately east of them, west of them, whichever atmosphere is going. <laughs> uh, so they can do some like large scale impacts. All the boreal forests in Canada and stuff are like the world's lung. They're responsible for all the good stuff that we get to breathe all the time. Uh, but then even like small scale, all those different things we're talking about, like trees over different water systems and stuff, they're influencing all stuff immediately right there. Uh, you want to really get you jazz, talk about fungal interaction with all these tree roots, right? And then all the millions of different things that exist in the forest world below us. Sequestering carbon trees themselves, like old growth forests, the coolest part about them is the forest soils. They are storing so much, again, uh, Thinking of the boreal forest, the permafrost start to do uh, a bit too much melting um, for the rest of us. They're storing so much carbon underneath in those root systems and all the stuff that they've been building up in that space, right? So they are just the really awesome living infrastructure of really big, beautiful ecosystems that the uh, vast majority of a lot of things that exist on this planet live in, if you're terrestrial, like us, right? Um, also, this is like fun stuff like this. Uh, right, like the trees, green spaces, do a lot of research behind using proximity. Like you're a happier, level-minded human, right? So if nothing else, uh, they make us happier, and all the other cool things. We good? There are cupcakes. Uh, it's still sharing how to make how trees make the world better. Yes, correct. No, no, yeah. All right, sorry, sorry, I'll get just yet. Carol's going to So give me two or three minutes up here tonight um, as the whole series. We like to at the end um, put our thanks to those people involved and then to send you away with, with a little. And for you, Carol, because you need to find the same spider. <laughs> yeah. um, um, we. Um, uh, Ali, we really <laughs> go back a minute here. I'll take a breath here. All right. I, I on behalf of Poles and the, and the Grand Traverse Conservation District, want to thank Ali for her time and putting together today's presentation and coming today after running a local, local run. <laughs> um, you can see how this morning. You can see how knowledgeable she is and how much she can answer just at, um, at your beck and call. Um, after coming to the Spider Lake Property Owners Association meeting last year, our last summer, a number of people called on her and they heard all kinds of good things about the information that she shared with them. So as a 
Forrester. She has a ton of information, but it goes beyond that, as you can see what she presented today. So thank you so much. And you can see um, just from the information too and how she put it together, how, how knowledgeable she is. Um, I hope you go away from this with um, some more knowledge, not um, certainly about trees and really appreciate what they do in, in our environment, especially with that last list that she put out. Perhaps we can share that in email with all our attendants virtually and, and in, in person and perhaps advertise it in other ways. Um, I also want to um, thank the Grand Traverse Conservation District for working with us and collaborating with them. Steve Largent, Ali, Hopi, thank you for being here today. I understand they put in their budget this year um, a special new piece of technology, this little, little, little gizmo here called the owl. If you look closely, it looks like it has two eyes and a beak, and it's um, helping uh, capture this presentation um, for to be on recording or to be recorded for later, as well as to have our, our um, virtual people participate. So speaking of the, of, um, the recordings, uh, it was mentioned earlier in, in today's meeting that on the Grand Traverse Conservation's website, Grand Traverse Conservation District, not county, Conservation District's website, they have all of the presentations we um, put together in the past. Those are the topics that are there. So if you want to learn more about how to preserve your lake and shoreland, please go to their to their website and look for those. Um, I also want to thank you all for, for coming today for your interest, both those that have come here in person and those that have attended virtually. If you've enjoyed uh, today, um, please tell your friends and families to look for the recording on the website and to look for those other ones um, that are already there. Again, if you've enjoyed today's uh, presentation and have learned more that you'll take away, and if you appreciate the other things that the Grand Traverse Conservation District does, feel free to make a donation to them. You can talk with any of the staff that are here today. Um, or you can go to their website and, and easy way to do it. And there's a link there to make a direct uh, donation. One of the things I enjoy doing, doing most um, after, after working with others to put, put together the annual polls presentations is to ask you all to take a moment and think about, um, think about our environment and what you can do as an individual or as a family, either on your own property or in your community. And as we, pre as we prepared for uh, this presentation today, I came across this, this quote, and this is from way back, way back in 1960, Baba Dioam, a Singhalese forestry engineer, wrote in a paper, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So I hope today that, I think, I believe that today Allie has taught us a lot and believe that you'll go away with that knowledge and act in your community in your yard, plant a tree, nourish a tree, even go farther than that and do that in your community. Thank you all for coming. Thank you that are here virtually. For those, that have, those of you that are here in person, uh, feel free to stay and mingle. There sounds like there's a lot more discussion that can go on. There are deciduous and evergreen cupcakes. <laughs> Thank you.